Uh, has anybody here in this room used node fibers before? Or generators in HTML5 generators? Or XMScript 6 generators? OK, cool. So since you don't know what I'm about to talk about, just assume that everything I say is true. <laughs> okay. Uh, OK, if you can't be bothered to sit here and listen to me blather, you just came for the free sandwich, um, you can get these slides uh, at github.com slash laser slash slides. And if you want to play around with uh, some of the examples that I'm going to show you, I've got a working uh, set of generator like how to sort of examples at es6gen.rokuapp.com. You're going to need a browser that, uh, that implements the ECMAScript 6 draft specification uh, for generators. So you're going to have to run Chrome Canary or like the newest build of Firefox. But you can play around with this stuff uh, after, the, after the talk. OK, so we're talking about generators. What does that actually mean? Um, I'm, I'm going to try to demonstrate some way to take uh, asynchronous code um, that looks like this, which is you know, probably kind of familiar if you've been in JavaScript land for a while. Uh, you've got a couple things going on here. You've got, uh, you've got flow control um, codified via nested callbacks. You've got uh, synchronous try-catch mixed in with asynchronous error handling. A bunch of sloppy stuff uh, and pretty, you know, I, I would say like idiomatic JavaScript, unfortunately. It's about taking that code and turning it into something that looks like this. So a variety of things are happening here. Um, I'll get into exactly how they're achieved. But uh, we can mix uh, asynchronous and synchronous error handling uh, together. We can handle them in the same way with try catch built into the language. We can write asynchronous code that appears to be synchronous. Um, we can move from writing code continuation passing style to direct style programming, which is going to be more familiar if you're coming from Ruby, Java, uh, any of the other uh, imperative languages that don't typically rely on asynchronous callbacks. OK, so specifically, um, it's my position that programming around asynchronous callbacks is hard, especially if you uh, are not used to it. Um, like, I think as you've been writing JavaScript for a long time, you just sort of like get numb to the pain of programming in an asynchronous <laughs> environment. Uh, but if you're coming to the language fresh, um, and you've been writing Python in your job, your boss tells you you have to like build the web 2.0 Angular application, uh, wrapping your head around the asynchronous callback stuff can be kind of a pain. But so uh, ECMAScript 6 generators alleviate some of that pain. They allow you to write that uh, asynchronous code that actually looks synchronous, reads from top to bottom. OK, so uh, demonstrating uh, why generators are awesome, I'm going to try to do it uh, by enumerating some gripes about programming around asynchronous callbacks, and then I'll try to address those issues uh, with generators. So it's my position, uh, first thing, uh, that it is a non-trivial amount of effort to follow the path of execution through a JavaScript uh, program. So I've got some straw man examples that like uh, back these things up. Uh, let's say you were coming into JavaScript for the first time. We have all made this error. Uh, where synchronous uh, variable definition at the top of the, say, the outer scope. <clears throat> and then we do a console.log message. And what we get is uh, hello, because this stuff happens on tick one of the event loop, and this happens on tick one, you know, some future tick of the event loop. So the assignment, uh, that message plus equals profile name, happens long after console.log message has output something. Uh, and that's kind of a pain uh, when you're first coming into the language. The other thing that is super annoying, uh, and <coughs> especially so in node environments, is uh, mixing error handling across, uh, handling errors that happen across multiple ticks of the event loop in the same place. So you've got try catch built in the language, but uh, the only errors that are going to be caught in this catch block are errors that are thrown synchronously in this try block. So, for instance, like if, uh, if an error happens in this asynchronous function, let's just assume for a second that, like, get and post are just thin wrappers around like an asynchronous like HTTP client. Um, if if some get data, which is a synchronous operation, uh, throws something that can get caught here. But if you have an error that is thrown, let's say, in the in the body of this uh, function expression, or if like in node style callback land, if you get an error and you want to handle that in the same place as your synchronous operations, you have to do things with closures, pass around error handlers, um, and it's a bit its a bit of a mess. Uh, so as I was saying, just walking through this again real quick, so some get data that say this is a synchronous operation, that can get caught here, 
my apologies for standing directly in front of this thing. Um, that can get caught with that catch block. Uh, if I want to handle errors in the same way across uh, future takes of the event loop, I have to do some plumbing. I have to pass this reference to that uh, on that name function expression at the top. Um, third thing, uh, I think the flow control uh, in an asynchronous environment <coughs> is kind of a pain in the butt. If you want to do things in series and you want to do some other things concurrently, uh, you have to rely on tools, or you can do things uh, in just vanilla JavaScript, but uh, your asynchronous operations end up with callbacks that know about the other things that you're going to do uh, with the data that you get back from some asynchronous operation. So, uh, an example, this is vanilla JavaScript. Um, what we're doing here, we're going to issue two HTTP requests, one to slash token, one to slash key. We're going to get the results back some point in time in the future, and when both of those two things are done, uh, we are going to call this login function. So we call get token, get key, we pass these anonymous function expressions as asynchronously executed callbacks. When they're done, we have to check in the body of this function expression, um, have we completed both operations? If so, do this login thing. I have to do the same thing down here. When that happens, then I'm going to do a couple things in series. I'm going to do a post to off, and then when that's done, I'm going to redirect the web browser. Um, we can alleviate some of that boilerplate by using promises. Uh, there's a sort of higher order way to, uh, to, to organize things that you want to do concurrently uh, and combine that with things that you want to do uh, sequentially. So this is functionally the same code, um, but there's a lot of noise here around, uh, around um, telling essentially the library uh, in which order you want to do things. So uh, token key and key key, these are both promises uh, that need to be resolved uh, and can be resolved uh, concurrently before we go ahead and do this post. So there's two things concurrently, then something in series, then this other thing uh, next. So it gets a little easier with promises, but it's still a bit of boilerplate. Uh, using async waterfall, anybody here use async JavaScript? Yeah, okay. So this is the kind of code that I find myself like writing all the time uh, to do things. Uh, they call it parallel, it's a crappy name. Concurrently, and then some things in series. There's a ton of code here. Really, all I want to do is issue three HTTP requests and then redirect the web browser. Uh, and there's a bunch of boilerplate here. You can get rid of some of these like intermediate uh, anonymous function expressions by doing partial application and stuff like that. But it's just a ton of code. And I don't want to write all this code, and I definitely don't want to maintain all this code. OK, so um, what exactly are generators? The name is a little confusing. Um, the draft specification calls them first-class coroutines represented as objects encapsulating suspended execution context. Oh. Which is like, <laughs> I, I, you know, I pull that out at, at cocktail parties to sound smart. But um, you can think of them as uh, functions that can be suspended at some point uh, other than, sorry, they're functions that can be entered and exited and re-entered um, at various points in their body. They don't just start executing from top to bottom. Um, you can execute some of the code, stop, resume it later, suspend, etc., etc. And I'll walk you through some examples to uh, see exactly what that what that looks like. Okay, so um, you may be saying like I'm ECMAScript six, like oh, I have to write code that runs on like wheel rep, wheel rep web browsers or whatever. Um, it, it's totally a draft specification, but it's getting closer to uh, actually being stamped into you know, some stone tablet so that vendors can actually implement. Uh, generators and in a standard way. Right now you get it in uh, Firefox. Firefox has actually had generators for a couple years now, but the, the interface is a little different than what you see supported uh, in Canary uh, or the, the draft specification. Um, you can use this stuff today in Node as of 011 with the Harmony flag. Uh, and if you're fine with a trans, like if you're fine with a trans compilation step, you can actually write generator code and transpile that to, uh, to JavaScript that will run on an ECMAScript, and on a browser that implements the ECMAScript 5 specification. Or in a, job, in a browser whose JavaScript implements the ES5 specification. So I think like uh, most of the stuff that you're probably getting paid to write software for right now. OK, so uh, this is the hello world of generators. Um, you can imagine that this code is all in the same scope. Uh, I've split it into the left and right. The left hand side is generator function, the right hand side is going to be us interacting with the generator function. And I did that so you'll see how we'll bounce back and forth. So we'll start with like some like corny, super simple examples, and we'll build and build and build until we're writing uh, asynchronous 
HTTP client uh, manipulation code um, using generators in that style that I demonstrated at the beginning of this presentation. Okay, so some new syntax. Um, some things you can notice here, a little asterisk after the, the word function, and there's a yield uh, right here. The asterisk denotes a generator function, and the yield uh, demonstrates, the, the yield denotes where the generator function can be suspended and resumed. Um, if you find your, if, if the yield exists inside the body of a non-generator function, you're going to blow up uh, when your browser reads that, uh, reads that file. So this is new syntax. Okay, so right hand side, um, first thing we're going to do, we're going to call the uh, generator function by name. So the name is Fibonacci, we're going to call it. And uh, what that's going to do is it's going to give us back a generator object. It's actually not going to start, we're not going to actually uh, start running through the code in the body of the function. So what we get back is this generator object. It's got some methods on there. The first one that we're going to interact with is next. We call next. This next is uh, a synchronous operation. We're going to start evaluating the code from top to bottom. So we do some declaration, bar A, B, C, do some assignment, 0, 1, 0. And we just start executing code from top to bottom. We hit our while true, true is true, and then we get down to this yield thing. And what that does is it suspends the generator function. So whatever uh, this expression is on the right hand side of yield, uh, that will be made available to the caller of the generator function. Um, the return value of next is going to be an object with a value property that's going to be equal to whatever the result of reducing this expression down uh, is going to be. And then the generator function just stops. It's frozen. It's frozen in time. So we've only gotten to this point. We haven't done any of this stuff yet. It's frozen, and then we synchronously yield control back to the caller. So uh, if we do some substitution here, um, dot value. A equals zero. Because remember, we just went from top to bottom. A equals zero, B one, whatever. A, the first time around, is equal to zero. So now we log zero to the console. We go down, um, we call next again, and we resume the generator function immediately after uh, the, immediately after the yield. Um, which is different, obviously, than other functions, right? Where you're always entering from the top and you're always exiting at the point of return or the implicit return at the end in JavaScript. <clears throat> so now, we do some more assignment, the next step of the Fibonacci sequence. We hit our guard, true is still true. We hit yield, A is now different because of the assignment that we've done here. We yield the expression, generator function is frozen again, it's suspended. And then we actually get a new value over here on the right hand side. So you can sort of see how we're bouncing back and forth between the body of the generator function and the, call, uh, the code that interacts with it. Um, you can sort of see where we're going here. Uh, we're going to output the numbers in the Fibonacci sequence on the right hand side. And the generator function um, is going to be suspended until we call it next. The bouncing back and forth thing is the important part of generator functions. Uh, or the ability to bounce back and forth and re-enter the generator function body expression at the point of yielding. Okay, we're going to get a little, little, little maybe a bit more complicated here. Um, scrutinize this code for a little bit. Let's just assume that log is an alias to console.log. This is all the code that we've got. Uh, that we're going to talk about in the slide. Can someone tell me, can someone take a guess as to what three things we are going to log with the console? I'm not going until someone gives me an answer. That's not true. I'll give you five seconds. All right. All right. We'll see. We'll see. Anybody? Yes. No. Alex. You got anything? No. All right. Okay. So in the the prior example, um, we were bouncing back and forth between the caller of a generator function uh, and the body of a generator function. Um, in this example, we'll demonstrate how you can actually pass values to the generator function. So starting at the top, um, we're going to call pow generator, which is our generator, our named generator function expression. Um, we're going to get back that generator object, we're going to store it in G, and then we're going to call next, which is just going to start executing code from top to bottom. We're going to do our declaration, and then we're just going to follow the order of operations uh, in the language. So first, uh, the first expression we're going to get is math.pow, The math.pow is being called with some sub-expressions. Um, the one on the left is going to be the one that's going to be evaluated first. Uh, it's got a yield in there, so we're going to suspend the generator function at that point. We haven't actually called math.pow yet, and we actually haven't done this yield yet, 
I'm just doing this one. The generator function is suspended, we get that value back. So the first thing we're going to output to the console is A. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to resume the generator function, but we're going to pass it a value. And this is different than in the, the other example of Fibonacci sequence where we were just calling next. It didn't really matter. Like uh, We didn't actually have any values to pass the generator function. In this example, 10 is actually something that we can imagine being substituted in immediately at, after the point in which we suspended the generator function. So we're going to resume the generator function with a value. In this case, it's going to be 10. So then we continue just following the order of operations in the language. We're going to yield B back to the caller of the generator function, which is going to be made available via that value property. We're going to output B. And then finally, we're going to resume the generator function with the value 2, which is substituted back in generator function at the point at which we, uh, we resume it. So then we can finally do map.pow, take 10 to the power of 2, and return that thing. So we get to the console, it is A, and then B, and then 100. So not only here are we just bouncing back and forth between a generator function and a caller of the generator function, we can actually pass it values. And that's going to be important uh, when we're working in a synchronous environment because the things that we're going to be passing the generator function are going to be uh, callbacks, to, callbacks to fire asynchronously, which will allow us to sort of yield control to the asynchronous part of our application. When that thing is complete, resume our generator function uh, with some values that are the results of these uh, asynchronous operations. Okay, so I enumerated some things that I was like writing about uh, programming around asynchronous callbacks. Promises make it a little easier. You've got libraries like async that are pretty cool, um, but it gets much, much easier uh, when you're using generators. So, a little refresher. Um, we're mixing synchronous and asynchronous code here. Uh, this anonymous function expression is going to be executed at some future tick of the event loop, but by the time this assignment happens, that console.log message, which is a synchronous operation, uh, has already fired. And that's kind of a bummer. With generator functions, um, we can uh, we can do this in a more direct style, uh, and not actually have to like think too much about our asynchronous operations as asynchronous operations. Um, okay, so explaining exactly what this piece of code does, you're seeing some new things. This sync function is a library that we are going to implement uh, in this talk. Um, sync is being passed an anonymous generator function expression which you'll notice it's got a little asterisk thing. And that anonymous function expression is going to be passed. Its only argument is going to be a function that we are going to pass to our asynchronous operation as the, the callback to be executed sometime in the future. So remembering like what we know about generator functions, we're going to start executing this code from top to bottom. We're going to find this asynchronous operation on the right-hand side of yield. We're going to suspend the generator function, and we're not going to resume it until the asynchronous callback passed to get profile uh, has been executed. When that happens, we're going to resume the generator function with a value here, which we can then assign to profile. So we can write code that is asynchronous, but actually does look synchronous. So, sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's the. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're going to we're going to implement uh, <coughs> sync. Sync is not something provided to you um, by the language. <coughs> This is uh, a super pared down version of like uh, Genrun or CO or Jenny or any of these like libraries that exist out there that uh, enable you to write this style of code around generators. Okay, so sync. The sync function, uh, this unary function is passed our anonymous generator function expression or name function expression, doesn't really matter. Um, the point is that gen needs to be a generator. Um, our generator, we're going to call it right away, and then we're going to store uh, that generator object. We're going to call next on it. So what that's going to do is it's just going to start immediately executing that code in that uh, executing the code in that generator function from top to bottom immediately. Um, resume this function expression. We're going to pass to our generator function as its only argument, which means that this resume parameter at the top is going to be equal to uh, the function that we've defined in sync. And all that resume is going to do is going to call next with a value. So you can imagine this function is the thing that's being passed as the uh, callback to be executed sometime in the future for our asynchronous operation. We're making some assumptions on uh, the arity of that callback and also like what we're getting in what order. Um, but assuming like a node style callback will say that when my like asynchronous operation completes, 
if I have an error, it's going to be first, and the value that I get back from uh, completing that asynchronous operation will be the second thing. I'm going to resume my suspended generator function with that value. And what that allows us to do, like I said, <coughs> is suspend this, uh, suspend execution of this code until we actually get a value from doing an HTTP request to profile, which is an asynchronous operation. Okay, so exception handling. Um, I was talking about uh, how much of a pain in the butt it is to consolidate error handling um, across multiple ticks of the event loop in the same place, uh, and also combining synchronous error handling with asynchronous error handling. Um, with generators, it gets much easier. So uh, some lib.get data, as I mentioned before, is a synchronous operation, so that thing could uh, throw an error that could be caught here. Also, these asynchronous operations if any error is passed to their, uh, their asynchronously executed callback, we can handle that using the try catch that's built in the language with a slight modification to our sync function. Um, I didn't demonstrate this in uh, the earlier slides, but a generator function can be resumed with a value to substitute in. Remember, we were doing the Fibonacci thing where we sent it 10 and that you know, <coughs> substitute that in. You can actually resume a generator function uh, with a value that is immediately thrown inside the body of the generator function. So, uh, assuming that our asynchronous operation, if passed an error, will be the first parameter, if we get one of those things, we can resume the generator function immediately throwing an error. And what that's going to allow us to do is catch in here. So, this synchronous operation could throw, we could catch in here. Uh, this asynchronous operation, if it's, uh, if it's callback and passed an error, it'll resume the generator function right here and immediately throw. So, try and catch, try catch can be used uh, both synchronous both around synchronous things and asynchronous things. Um, last thing was about flow control. Uh, I was whining about combining uh, things that you want to do concurrently with things that you want to do in series and how much code you have to write, blah, 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 blah. Um, promises make that a little easier, async too, but it's still a bunch of code. With generators, um, with a slight modification uh, to our sync function, we can express things that we, we can express that we want to do things concurrently uh, just by leveraging um, the order in which expressions are reduced in JavaScript. So what we're doing here, we made a modification to our sync function. And if you really care to see what that is, um, you can check that out or come talk to me afterwards and I'll explain it to you. But our resume function is a higher order function that is going to increment the counter and return uh, a function that we're going to pass to our asynchronous operation. So what we're going to do here, we're going to call get token we're going to increment a counter here, and we're going to increment a counter here, and we're not going to resume the generator function until we've got both uh, results. Then we end up with an array uh, containing, in the first slot, the result of doing that request to token, and in the second slot, uh, doing the post to key. So it's still top-down um, synchronous. Uh, sorry, it's still top-down direct style programming, but it's uh, it's easy to express things you want to do at the same time alongside things you want to do one step at a time. Um, I was explaining the higher order function thing here, so resume when you call it, it's going to increment a counter. We're going to suspend the generator function, and we're going to resume it only when uh, when we've got all the, basically like the counter decremented to zero. So this is only a portion of what would be required to implement uh, sync in this way. Um, I won't explain all this code, but it's pretty, the, the point is that it's not actually uh, super difficult to write a library that would enable you to do things you know, at the same time, two things at the same time, and then, you know, the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. Whether or not you think this is like achieving the goal of reducing boilerplate, it's totally up to you, uh, but I find that it's much easier to, um, to look at the body of a generator function um, and identify the places where things are being done concurrently than sifting through a bunch of like uh, async code or um, higher order like promise manipulation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's up? The yield there, which we've got an array, mm -hmm. it, does it execute that each part concurrently, or does it go from zero to one, two to three, four? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, what this is going to do is uh, we're going to encounter the yield keyword, and then we're going to yield the result of reducing this expression down as far as we can. Um, and what that means is uh, we're going to hit this array, um, and this array uh, the items in the array at this point are actually expressions that themselves need to be reduced. 
So what we're going to do is first thing we're going to um, we're going to reduce this thing down to uh, a function, and then we're going to reduce this thing down, and then synchronously, uh, same thing of the event loop, we're going to reduce this thing down. Um, so we're going to actually issue this request to token uh, and this request to uh, to key on the same ticket event loop, if okay. that makes any sense. And then when it gets passed back to its uh, to the generator, it'll just be an array with two values in it. It'll be an array with two values, and uh, the code okay. that I very like quickly breezed through here um, actually pays attention to the position so that you get back an array whose values are in the order that you expect. Um, and this is like a super lame feature impoverished implementation of sync. Uh, real computer programmers uh, <laughs> that are not me uh, have written libraries that like handle this in a fairly robust way with good error handling and stuff. Um, but this at least demonstrates the concept. Like uh, you can increment this counter. When the counter has been decremented back to zero, you yield the array that contains the results of all of these uh, all of these asynchronous operations. Um, yeah, so I should have actually like walked through uh, walked through this, uh, but this is just following the order of operations in the language. So you hit yield, you got this array which contains itself sub expressions which you need to reduce. Res gets reduced to a function, then you call get. Get has no return values and asynchronous operations. You get undefined. You do the same thing on the right hand side. You get undefined. Generator function suspends. So remember we're like frozen in time right here until those two asynchronous operations complete. At which point we resume the generator function with the values of, uh, that we get back in those, um, those asynchronously operated functions. And then we just go from top to bottom. Just following the order of operations of the language, suspend, resume, suspend, resume, throw errors if you find them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so um, I talked real fast, and I maybe didn't make as much sense. But to summarize here, um, generators, uh, in my opinion, enable direct style uh, coding. And they don't block the event loop. So you get all the magic of like a single thread like uh, JavaScript uh, concurrency pa uh, concurrency model. Um, but you can write code that feels familiar uh, and uh, you know can be can be easily represented. You can easily represent things that are going to be done one at a time, but things are going to be done concurrently. Um, you can start playing around with this stuff in Chrome Canary today, uh, in Firefox with the Harmony flag as of 011. Um, in Firefox, or if you're fine with using uh, the Tracer transpiler, you can experiment in any uh, browser that allow you to use ES5 features. Um, it's my opinion that uh, adoption of promises, once the specification becomes a specification and not just a draft, uh, will change the shape dramatically of uh, the code that we're writing in JavaScript. I think um, there's already a, what is it called, like COA in, in, um, in Nodeland. Which is uh, kind of like connect with a promise. Uh, sorry, with generators instead of uh, callbacks. So people are already starting to think about it. Um, I encourage you to go experiment with it. Uh, you can use this stuff today. Uh, that's it. That's all I got. Oh yeah, one other thing. Um, if you want to read about generators, uh, Toby Ho, Tim Castle have been writing about them for a long time. Andy Wingo talks about performance uh, specifically in V8. I think he's on the V8 team. So if you have questions like what are the performance implications of using generators, like Go ask Andy Wingo. I can't talk about him really all that much. Um, check these guys out. Follow me on Twitter at Lasericus. Uh, check out these code examples, es6gen.herokuapp.com. The slides are up uh, at um, github.com slash laser slash slides. And if you are interested in this kind of stuff, uh, check me out at the Carbon 5 blog. Name is Aaron with an E. Thanks. Make them easy, please. <laughs> yes, Alex. Have you actually uh, used uh, um, generators in any of your client work? No. No. Uh, mostly because the, the the few projects that I that I would have had the opportunity to the projects that like uh, I thought um, were greenfield enough that I could like start using uh, generators in the beginning had browser support. Constraints that like didn't allow me to, to do that, and I personally like don't like transpilers because you're gonna have to like debug that code and 
Trace store actually ships a runtime also, so it's a bunch of like stuff. So no, I haven't done. Uh, I'm not using generators uh, in any client work, but I've certainly been using it uh, in projects that I'm doing for myself. Yeah. Uh, what about the aggregate performance of generators? When you start putting a lot of generators together, they're not optimized by anybody. And I know in the case of Firefox and supposedly in the case of Chrome, the dev teams have no plans of doing any advanced optimizations on generators. Yeah. Well, the the question was about performance. What are the performance like implications uh, for an application that leverages generators? Um, so one hand wavy response is uh, performance is going to vary like per vendor implementation, right? Um, Andy Wingo wrote a blog post not long ago about like what basically someone was asking him like what is what is the performance overhead of using generators instead of um, just raw callbacks? And uh, I'm going to get it wrong, but uh, to summarize, like from his perspective, it was negligible. And he was specifically talking about V8. Um, I don't know what, uh, I can't speak exactly to the optimization issue that you're talking about, um, but he, on the VA team, didn't seem to think that it was that big of a deal. I, and I don't personally, like, I haven't written a lot of um, code that is going to be blocked on CPU in JavaScript. Um, I'm mostly, like, waiting on I.O. And the performance implications here, I think that you're talking about, are actually, like, the CPU. Uh, so it has been, in my experience, not uh, a ton of, not a big price to pay. Um, the performance implications I'm talking about is uh, you know they use sort of different compilation, uh, compilation levels to just uh, run the JIT. Okay. So they start off interpreted, then they go to baseline compiler, and mm -hmm. then they go to an optimized compiler. Mm -hmm. However, nobody currently has any plans to optimize any generator functions okay. beyond baseline compilation, which means all of that nice performance you see you get when you use the function in front of a lot, um, you're not going to see that if you put that same thing into a function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you're saying, like uh, regular functions mm -hmm. like can be optimized in a different way than like generator functions. The, a regular function if you take from a baseline compilation mm -hmm. to an advanced compilation is going to get a couple of orders of magnitude faster than basis. Okay. But you're not going to be able to do this. Yeah, I mean, I, I still think you're talking about like uh, I still think you're talking about like synchronous performance, and like I said, like the applications that I find myself writing are never like they're never. I'm not, I don't find that they are constrained by synchronous operations. Like I'm always waiting on some HTTP response. I'm always waiting on like uh, information from the database or whatever. So I totally agree that like that is like concerning, um, but it's not a problem that I find myself having in my day to day. But it is interesting. I, I did not know that, like, um, I, I didn't know that about generator functions. Um, I'm interested in, like, reading more about it. I, Do you have any recommended, like, folks to talk about or to the, read who are talking yeah, about that? The only thing that I know is that it's, it's been put forward that a potential solution is to make sure in your generator functions you limit them to more or less yield statements. You take anything that doesn't need real amount of work into a real function and then be optimized inside of the generator. Interesting. So that may be a good yeah, interesting. Yeah, the suggestion was to potentially move uh, the code that does real work out of the generator function and into a regular function that can be optimized in a, in a different way. And can be called inside the generator function. So the yeah. performance inside the generator function, the generator function, you can actually get to the optimized function. So cool. Cool. There, there's maybe the work around that. Yeah. You don't stack large amounts of generator functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I didn't demonstrate, <clears throat> I did not demonstrate uh, generator functions yielding to other generator functions, which you can do. Um, there's special syntax for it. Uh, but uh, I think as this uh, draft specification becomes like uh, not a draft, that there'll be more people writing about this stuff. There'll be more browsers to experiment, more, you know, uh, more environments to, to play around in. So yeah, it's cool stuff. Hey, what's up? Um, are there any, like, the, the return value of the next that have that value property? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else in there that's interesting? Yeah, there, there is. Um, there is, I believe, uh, I have to look, but there's a, um, there's a, what is there? There's like a, 
like a completed property, or at least there was at one point in time uh, in the Firefox implementation. There are there are some different properties that tell you about the state of that uh, generator uh, object, and and also the generator function itself, uh, more than just that value. Mm -hmm. it, it, two for functions to <coughs> use the same generator, is there a, a chance? It, it almost seems to be designed that it, they both do that, and it just uses the same local scope as the generator both times. Um, let me think about that. The, the scope of the generator, it is a function, right? So it's got its own uh, scope independent from the caller. Uh, there, if there were two functions uh, outside, if there were two places where you resume the generator function, like that's totally valid. Um, but the scope, the scopes are are different. Like the generator okay. function is just a regular like function. Yeah, so when you, when you, so you pass the callback, it will wrap up the local scope and pass that to the callback. That's what the JavaScript does. But I don't know how to get the error of the JSON. Yeah, I mean you can pass you can pass a value to a generator function, and that value can be a function which itself closes over some like variables in its outer scope. Um, so you can you know like you, you pass you pass whatever values you want. Those values could be functions that travel along with the uh, with other values that you closed over. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else? Cool. Thank you very much.